In this episode of the podcast, Gwilym came to us with a little problem. He is about to start his newsletter and uh, Jamie and I have had newsletters going for the best part of a year. And so we gave him all the thoughts that we had on building a newsletter up from zero in the creator economy. Please enjoy this episode. I need your guys advice because you are two uh, people who have newsletters uh, in the creator economy. And I am starting a newsletter after a whole year of dithering around and not having a newsletter. So let me let me explain what newsletter. I'm, I think you guys can guess exactly what it would look like anyway. But let me explain. Basically, there are three reasons I want a newsletter. It's going to be about YouTube, creator economy, writing in the creator economy, advice for ad, mainly advice for people who want to create content, but also for freelancers who are working in that field. And I think the three main reasons I want to do it is. One is that it, it, it helps you um, working with clients is one thing, but actually taking a step back and trying to articulate your thoughts about YouTube as a whole, I think is really useful. Um, uh, and so I think it'll be a, it'll be a kind of way to exercise my mind about that type of thing and actually writing things down. Um, secondly, it'll give me something to talk about on social media more. Um, I probably already have plenty of things to talk about, but I feel like if I've written a newsletter, it will then be easier to turn that into tweets and have a have a regular presence. Um, and thirdly, I think it's just a good good way of getting clients, to be honest, and building a personal brand in a way that when you work on client projects, you um, yes, you're, 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 you're practicing your craft. Yes, you're getting extra credibility from having worked with those people. Yes, you're making money, but um, you're, not, you're not cementing your own personal brand. Um, and that's what I kind of want to start doing. So yeah, I'm interested in general thoughts on what you guys have experienced doing your own newsletters. And um, yeah, any thoughts from you guys? Um, one thing... This is particularly kind of relevant for, well, to, to my life at the moment, because after we, well, a lot of us, uh, we had a kind of chat the other day about business goals and where we wanted to go with this whole YouTube thing. And a realization that I had was that the the niche that I'd found for my newsletter was actually something that I wasn't getting much enjoyment out of. Uh, and there was a fair bit of trepidation that came with that because I thought, well, this is kind of like I'm entirely growing my personal brand off of this thing that I do and that I talk about three retention graph breakdowns every week and whatever else. But I just put the question out there uh, to everyone, you know, to my subscribers and just said, I'm thinking I don't always enjoy doing this. Do you just open this thing for the reviews or is it for something else? Um, and I think I got about 50 people filled out the the form and one person said, ah, it's for the reviews. I would not open it otherwise. Everyone else uh, voted the other way. I got lots of replies to it as well from people being like, we just like, we don't really care what it is. Uh, we're just interested in what you've done and, and what advice you might have from it. So I think that was really eye opening for me and something that's super valuable for for you is that you're in such a strong position with where you've come from in this YouTube thing and the clients you work with now. Um, I think people will just be very, very interested to hear what it is, what, what it is that we, well, any, any one of us, but, you know, again, as a writer, what you do for YouTubers and any insights that you can pluck from that, it feels to me like you've actually got a very broad canvas of things you could talk about. And actually, yeah, you don't necessarily need to hone in on one particular thing. Just, um, it feels like a good place for you to be. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, I I'm keen on. <laughs> I'm keen on not having too kind of rigid a structure. So I, I want to start the newsletter by like, this is something I've been thinking about this week. And then the next section would be, here is a video I would recommend you watch on YouTube because I found it interesting. Or like here was an interesting takeaway from this YouTube video that the creator did particularly well. Just getting, getting to it really quickly. Um, I think the thing that frustrates me most with other newsletters is they have uh, like a, sometimes like a whole intro spiel thing like, hey guys, welcome to the newsletter. This newsletter is about X, Y, Z. In this newsletter, we're going to be covering bullet points. I really hope you enjoy. And then they start and it's a kind of a formula. Um, 
open question is whether there's a, maybe a good reason for that. Maybe you want to make every newsletter um, intelligible to someone who's never read any of your stuff before. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm going for the, the low key. Here's what's on my mind approach. Yeah, I think that's probably good to go for at the beginning because it will give you more of an, an idea of what it is that you like to write about and also what your audience enjoy, right? Because you'll you have all of the data of people who open it and um, what they click, right? So if you're someone who does kind of similar to me where you find very interesting things and you put it in a video, uh, in, in an email and people click it, you can kind of start to track and say, okay, what is it that people really like here and do more of that? Or they might prefer you to, to break down a creator or for you to break down a particular topic about writing. Um, so I think to start off with, it makes complete sense to have that strategy of, I'm Gwilym, I'm a writer, I work for people in the YouTube space. I'm going to talk about that. And I'm also going to talk about the things I've learned and found interesting throughout the week, you know, come along for the ride. And then like three, six months down the line, you might decide to, to niche down into one particular area that, that's growing um, your, your audience. Um, I, I think it also comes down to, you know, how much time do you, do you want this to take you per week? Because that's, that's a key, key part of it. Yeah. So I, the plan is to have it to be a, a weekly newsletter. What I really don't want to do is to put out a newsletter for the sake of putting one out. Um, but on the other hand, I know that leaves the door open to like, do I really have something interesting to talk about this week? Maybe I should just not send it. So I think it probably is useful to lock yourself into, yes, one a week. I will always have something interesting to write. I remember you saying, George, um, uh, that some of your most interesting issues have come from times when you're like, ah, oh, fuck it. I, I don't know what to write about. I'll just write about this random thing that no one will surely be interested in. Um, and working with Ali, that was often the case as well. That he, when I was writing a newsletter with him, he'd be like, I really don't know what to talk about this week. And those were often the interesting bits. Mm. Yeah, I think that's it. And actually, I was speaking to somebody about their uh, their Twitter strategy recently. Um and they were saying, oh, I just feel I don't often know what, yeah, exactly the same problem, basically. And I said, that I think often just being vulnerable is actually one of the most engaging things that you can do when you're putting yourself out there publicly. And so actually, yeah, a, a little bit of self-reflection on a week where you actually don't know what to talk about could be an opportunity to think, well, why, why don't I have anything to talk about? What is it that I'm, what's the kind of mental block or the limiting belief or whatever it is that is making me feel as though there's, there's nothing to say? Yeah, with you, actually, the tweets that stick in my mind the most, you, you know, most tweets you just sort of read, and, oh, that's, that was interesting, and you move about your day, but some tweets kind of pop up in your brain later. And most of them are the ones that have a kind of narrative where it's like, it's just little old me, George, I don't really know what I'm doing. <laughs> but here, I'm tr but I'm trying. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The little engine that could, or whatever it's called. Um, <laughs> uh, so, and I think, yeah, yeah I think that's really, that, I think that's really useful for building, for, for brand building if you're if you're just starting out. But it it also feels real, at least for me, it feels really counterintuitive if you're trying to impress people to be. I don't know what I'm doing, um, because that's sort of the opposite of the message you want to give across. But at the same time, that will get people invested in you on a personal level and they will want you to succeed because you've been vulnerable with them. So, yeah. Yeah, I think it probably there's probably a, a kind of ratio of how often you want to you want to seem like you're being vulnerable and seem like, you know, exactly what you're talking about, um, probably weighted in favor of knowing what you're talking about. But uh, yeah, every so often works. And I think actually it's those 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 have been the moments, at least for my newsletter, where things have pivoted the most, where I when I, I started out exactly the same as you're describing where I didn't know what I was going to write about at all and I just wrote about whatever I could think of each week and it was getting nearer and nearer to the wire pretty much every week uh, in terms of how last minute it was coming up with a topic because I was just struggling a bit and then on one week where I was really really at my <laughs> wits end I decided to review some retention graphs from videos that I'd written and I think I was quite upfront about the fact that this was like a it was almost defensive I was just like look I don't know guys here's something hopefully this is this is a thing and the response to that was the best that I'd ever had and that then became what my newsletter was for the next six months literally it from that day it didn't it was then retention graph reviews and then the same exact thing again a moment of vulnerability 
after the the aforementioned business discussion that we had last Tuesday, I left that in a real stress, like really, I, I kind of sat down in the WeWork that we were in and was just kind of like panicking. And I was trying to, I was trying to set my mind to all these things that we'd identified that were problematic with uh, where my business was going and what I was enjoying, what I wasn't enjoying. And I was basically just like, ah, and tweeted something like, I'm stressed. I can't reply to everyone. I want to, I appreciate it, but just, I need, I need to figure some stuff out for a second. And again, the response to that was so reassuring from people because everyone's going through basically the same thing all the time. I feel everyone was very like, yep, that's fine. No worries. That then gave me the confidence to ask that question in my newsletter. Do you guys care about the retention reviews or not? And the response to that was no, we'll just open it, whatever you're talking about. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's a lot to be said for those moments of vulnerability when you're putting stuff out there. But again, if it's if it's just <laughs> 10 weeks in a row of, I don't know, <laughs> what should we talk about? Then <laughs> yeah. that's probably not going to get engagement either. But yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. Um, Jamie, how how do you feel about your newsletter direction and content? Because yours is a bit more um, uh, curated links. And this is what I've been seeing this week, which which is kind of what I want to make the second half of my newsletter into just so there is some content that almost writes itself yeah so for me i'm not a writer okay you two are, are writers and i think you're both very good at being able to take this your is thoughts a limiting belief, this it is a limiting, is a limiting, limiting belief. belief i know it's absolutely a limiting belief it 100 percent is which is why i've sort of gone the youtube road because it's like if i go the youtube road where i prefer to talk i prefer to kind of just go off the cuff, I can take those and turn those much easier into tweets rather rather than me kind of sitting there and say, okay, I need to write a tweet, which I know I can do. It's just from a ROI perspective, I think a YouTube video, an evergreen YouTube video that will sit there forever is way better than a tweet that's dead by, you know, the next day because all tweets are dead within like a week, right? Unless you always call back to them. And so for me, I've always kind of gone the YouTube road and it, I sort of took that uh, sort of mindset into the newsletter really and was that I don't I, I'm very busy with a lot of the different things that I'm doing within my business and the newsletter is an important part of that because you need to own your audience right you you need to be able to get people off of YouTube off of Twitter off of Instagram onto a newsletter because you own that audience that's why everyone talks about why why newsletters are so powerful and so I had to create one I've created one but I didn't want to spend all of this time every single week thinking, okay, I've got to try and come up with like basically an article, you know, it's, it's basically a blog post that you're writing every single week of like, what's this one key piece of information that I can, you know, condense into this really short but powerful newsletter that people are going to find, you know, in incredible. And so I, I didn't really have the time for that um, to, to really condense that and write that in an interesting way for a number of people and then do that on a weekly basis. It just felt like it was going to be an unnecessary pressure for me. And I, I did a lot of market research to kind of look at who are the top, you know, creator economy newsletters and, and the top newsletters everywhere for, for every single topic. And one of my favorite newsletters of all time that I've been subscribed to for over 10 years now is Tim Ferriss's Five Bullet Friday. And I know uh, many other YouTubers and creators have gone a similar route, so like Chris Williamson with his, I think it's called Th Three Minute Monday, pretty much the exact same thing. And he translates that into an Instagram and LinkedIn carousel as well. So it's it's kind of like one thing that you talk about um, versus three to five different things that you found around the web that are useful to you and others. And you can put, give your own thoughts on why that tool was incredible or why that YouTube video is really good and you should check it out because it's going to get you more views or, or more money or whatever it is. That to me felt easier for me on a weekly basis instead of having to almost like reinvent the wheel because I'm consuming these things anyway. I get to share other people's um, content, you know, I, I get to kind of like help my friends and other people who I found valuable of their, their videos or their articles or whatever, as opposed to me constantly having to generate things when my mind's more focused on getting my clients results or building my own YouTube channel or, or doing anything else that, that, that is that I'm doing. And so I, I sort of took the, the conscious decision that if Tim Ferriss has like over half a million people on his newsletter and all he does is share links why can I not do the same about the creator economy? Because there weren't many people doing that or anyone doing that. And so that was really my approach going into creating the newsletter. 
Interesting. Uh, yeah. Um, so two thoughts. One, how how successful do you feel the strategy has been so far? Like I'm genuinely curious. Um, because um, my my question, I think it, I think that it. <laughs> It is possible to look at what like the big dogs are doing and then be like that can that could work for me um and then you might end up posting twit like long twitter threads that are like here is how to like reinvent your life or whatever but no one cares because you're not tim ferris um and l yeah likewise i guess i i feel like your strategy jamie probably works really well if you're funneling people to the newsletter from another source like your youtube channel or um yeah maybe if they just like once they know you they trust your recommendations um yeah loose thoughts yeah so the reason why i took that approach is i have other areas where people will like i tweet every now and again and so people come from the twitter I have the thumbnail vault where if you sign up for that in the agreement is that you get signed up to the newsletter. The people that have signed up for the thumbnail vault, um, for those listening who don't know what that is, it's a website uh, with a library of over a thousand different thumbnails, like the best thumbnails on YouTube. And they're all sort of broken down into why they worked. And I've had thousands of people sign up for that. And so they all go onto the newsletter, which is really good. And the unsubscribe rate there is quite low for those who do sign up. They all stick around and it's because it's useful to get that every single week. And I have thought about doing things like, oh, let me write a little bit of a blog post or something in here before we get to the links. And maybe I will in the future. I don't know, but I kind of just think people know exactly what they're getting. And I kind of want to stick to that. And I think that's why people like Tim Ferriss's um, newsletter because Five Bullet Friday, it's been the exact same thing for over 10 years. And part of what sells it is the fact that it's just five bullet points. It, it's not not like, because I get so many newsletters and it's like, oh, like another like paragraph after paragraph after paragraph of something. Um, and it's, it's just it's just too taxing. Like I don't I don't really care. You know, and I, I'm i quite a, a visual person. I like videos uh, and I also like listening to podcasts, but I don't really like reading as much. And so I find that, that that tends to be the case of a lot of people who watch YouTube videos, right? That's why they're watching videos and not reading books or articles. And obviously there is a mixture there of people who do both, but a lot of people like to watch content. And so me being able to provide them with very good YouTube videos in the news, uh, in their inbox every single week is more valuable than me writing another blog post that's going to sit in their inbox with another five that have come through that week that they've also subscribed to. And it's demanding. Like what if it, you know, what if it hits the, the inbox of someone who just doesn't want to read right now, or it's too long. And like, it, it just feels almost like it's, it's wasted effort. But I think in your case, it, it makes more sense for you because you are a writer. You need something that is top of funnel, right? And this is one of the questions I was going to ask you was like, how are you going to get people on the list? Because in your case, you can write the the, the newsletter that can be translated to tweets or, or even carousels for Instagram and LinkedIn. And that will then feed people back into the newsletter and like vice versa. And and so you'll, you'll start to kind of like build this, this flywheel, which is what I think makes sense for you. Um, whereas as, as you pointed out at this stage, I'm not Tim Ferriss. Like I'm not this huge guy who's got millions and millions of people listening to him every single week. Um, but I believe as I build an audience, that newsletter will get stronger. And no matter how big that gets, the pressure is going to stay relatively the same because I've only got to share three links every week. Whereas in your case, if you had like 10,000, then 20,000, then 30,000, it's great. But now you're like, oh, okay. I've already got a, you know, come here with something to say because now I've got 50,000 people and there's a bit more pressure there and it, it might stress you out. So yeah, a, a lot of extra thoughts there, but yeah, it's, it, it, I would say try and try and go that experimenting r r route of just trying things out and define what your newsletter will be over time. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that it's definitely, it's definitely nice to have something that, that doesn't, that, that will never feel ominous. Um, uh, and yeah, I think that's the reason why at the moment I don't tweet that much is because I, I have a, a little editor who lives in my brain who's like, ooh, I don't know about that. Maybe sit in it for a few, for a, for like an hour or two, like maybe rewrite it later. Keep it in your notes app. Yeah, I think, I think, I think, 
I, I, I'm going to have to fight and kill that editor if I want to get the newsletter out regularly on time and uh, turn it into tweets. I think everyone has that with, with everything that they create. I, I feel that all of the time um, is why I sometimes don't tweet. And it could be something very useful, but I'm just like, mm, is it is it good enough? You know, is is that a, a good enough insight? And so sometimes I'll just wait until I have like the, the really big thing. But I think some of the best people out there are the ones who say the basics over and over again in different ways. And that's really how they build their Twitter audiences. And I think with a newsletter, you've only got to say it once, really, if you think about it as not just a newsletter, but a blog. If you had a website where those newsletters were then made into a blog post that people could even find through Google search, I think that really then does just change everything because the tweets expire after a couple of days. No one sees them. Similar for newsletters. People delete it. Never, no one ever really goes back and reads a newsletter, even if it is on something like Beehive or, or ConvertKit, where you can see all of the previous editions. No one really goes in there. But if it's on a blog, it, it might be a little bit more accessible. And so maybe that's sort of a strategy that you take as well. Um, so there's a guy who you surely probably know on Twitter called Visakan Virasami. Um, and he's got this, do you, are you familiar with him? I've seen Visa his tweets Can years v. ago, but I haven't seen his stuff in a while. Okay. No, great tweets. Um, but he has this ongoing thing. He, he's, his his approach is that he's building this sort of um, multiverse of his threads and tweet ideas. So often he, in the middle of a thread, he'll be like, and this is exactly what I was talking about here in this thread from 2018. Um, and he, he's got this sort of encyclopedic uh, amount of threads by now about, I don't know, being creative, being, uh, I don't know, self-doubt or writing or whatever it is. Um, and that's, I think that's a really cool model where you build out a lot of things that you constantly refer to, um, and that your audience, the more familiar your audience is with you, they'll just see the link and they'll be like, oh yes, that thing. I know that thing. I've read that thing. And if someone is not familiar, they'll be like, oh, what's that other thing that I could read? And so he's constantly, he's not having to re-say the same thing say, a lot of times. He's just linking, um, yeah, it's, it's creating a good his own strategy. Wikipedia. I've, I've seen Naval do it. I've seen Dan Co do it. Um, yeah, a lot of the big Twitter guys tend to have like this spider web of all their tweets pointing to one another. Um, kind of similar to YouTube where you have your end card and your um, info cards pop up and you just like, you're just pointing everyone everywhere. Um, it's, it's a good strategy. Same thing with like blog posts. You know, you have backlinks on all of these different websites that point to different areas. Um, on the website to really sort of build someone's knowledge up from from the foundations. One thing I found, because I tried that and I've done that a couple of times, is that the the threads that I've re-included have been ones that actually haven't performed that well. Um, but when taken together, people's response to it is, my word, what a lot of value in this one thing. When actually at the time, uh, yeah, some of the individual threads would get almost no traction at all. It was almost an excuse for me to try and get them in front of people again. Um, but yeah, as Jamie says, as you say, it's definitely worthwhile doing that. And you don't need that many as well, as long as, you know, f five five threads that you, you write and then you can kind of combine them in an order that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Um, a question for you, George, because I know you started your newsletter on Substack and now you're on Beehive. Oh, um, close. ConvertKit. So, oh, ConvertKit, sorry. Mm -hmm. It's you I'm that's on Beehive, on Beehive Jamie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so yeah, you started on Substack and now you're on ConvertKit. The question in my mind, because I remember you saying earlier um, that Substack um, is maybe makes your newsletter more findable. Um, what are your thoughts on where you would start if you were starting from zero today? Uh, yes, it, it would be. It would still probably be Substack. Um, the, the only the reason I switched was for the additional functionality of ConvertKit, which has ended up paying dividends in the end. But I remember being quite excited about the day I was going to switch to ConvertKit because I thought it would be like, you know, send them $200 or whatever it was for the 
under a thousand subscribers plan. And then by the end of the day, my audience is going to be in nice little segmented pockets and I'll be ready to just target them each for their individual needs and wants. And I'll be able to make this person buy this and I'll be able to tell this person the exact piece of advice they need to blow up their channel and all of that. But it actually is a lot of upfront work to do all of that stuff and to work out the segmentation and to learn about the uh, automations and integrations and all of that stuff. And I think if you're just trying to write about something that is interesting to you, Substack is a great place to to do that. And uh, again, I, I don't use it these days, so I don't know um, how it's doing, but I, I know it's it, the value of Substack is that it kind of goes beyond newsletters, right? You can start a podcast on there and it's kind of, it's a bit of a multi-use tool. Whereas uh, I think the convert kit switch or, or the beehive switch, whatever it is, is when you're maybe starting to build up that audience a bit more and you need to figure out, right, how am I going to scale this efficiently? How am I going to incorporate this as a part of my business rather than just an initial, let's just start building the personal brand and getting my thoughts out there. Yeah, that pushes me a bit more in the direction of Substack um, uh, because you can always move later on and take your whole um, mailing list wherever you like. Exactly. And um, there's also even then like there's so many uh, visual choices you have to make. So there's uh, potentially uh, the need to then integrate ConvertKit with uh, uh, Create and Sell. I don't know if you guys know Brennan Dunn, who's a kind of ConvertKit um, maestro. And he basically, his whole thing is that he makes ConvertKit emails look not bad because by default <laughs> they kind of look a bit meh, yeah. um, which I think Beehive definitely has over ConvertKit. Uh, yes. And so, yeah, there's a lot of like, yeah, visual choices you have to make, which Substack, you, you pick the color that you want your kind of store or whatever you want to call it to look like. And that's, that's about it. And then it's ready to go. Yeah. I'd, I'd recommend using uh, Substack as well, just, just to get started. Um, because the, the, like Beehive and ConvertKit do have quite a high cost. So if you don't have any newsletter followers, I think it's like $50 a month. And so depending on how quickly you get people in, you could find that you then end up spending, you know, nearly a thousand dollars by the end of the year. Um, Wait, is uh, that for Beehive? Beehive's about, I think, $49. Wow. Okay. ConvertKit is less, a lot less. I think ConvertKit is still pretty expensive from when I used it. When I, for under a thousand, well, I've now crossed a thousand, so I just got a nice little additional bill for for that little win. Um, But I think initially, yeah, it was like 250 maybe for the year. Oh, but Um, if you buy annual, it is discounted. Yeah. I'm just trying to find out the pricing now so we can say on the air. Um, Mm. So it's $25 a month for the Creator Pro. Okay, that's that's much cheaper than what it was a few months back. I know, but that's if you got yearly and you only had 300 subscribers. So I had like a thousand subscribers. Yeah, and it was costing me fifty nine dollars a month. Mm. And so that mm. that just scales. Like if you if you end up with five thousand uh, subscribers to your newsletter, you're paying a hundred and eleven dollars a month, um, which is pricey. Mm. But obviously you have 5,000 people at that point, you'll probably be making money from them that it'll pay for itself. Um, but it's just one of those things where um, not all of them are uh, like cheap or free. So I'd always like start out when you're first getting started, you're trying to you know test out all of these different newsletter formats. There's no point sticking with Substack until you get to a, a, a higher amount. You know, it's very similar to when we first got started, we were doing this and we're like, oh, we need the best website and da da da. And I was like, no, just create like a Notion website pretty simple, that will get you the job done. And you can think about that later down the line. I think that's probably the case here with with the newsletter. Something I've been thinking about um, as well is that if you're, if you're writing something and you're taking the time to do that, why not record it as well as something that people can listen to or as a video? I'm not sure where that video would go, um, but I remember... Um, um, I remember, I think once you did a video edition of your newsletter, George. Um, and I think that's what put the thought in my brain. Um, mm. You know, why why not have it each issue be like a five minute pod, mini, mini podcast? I believe Naval does those as well. Um, because yeah. just why not? You just need just need a, just need a mic, right? Yeah, there's no reason why you couldn't. I've, I've seen a few people do that before. Um, some people would have paid newsletters where it's stuff like that. And I think even like you say, it gives, uh, 
it gives an insight into what you sound like, what you look like. And I think, um, I feel like I mentioned Kieran Drew about every week, but he, he does a thing at the end of every newsletter. He, uh, just takes a picture of himself holding a piece of paper on which he's written the kind of key message of the newsletter, but it's just a chance to see like, oh, okay, it's, you're a real person and you've got a bit of quirky humor about you and there you are. Uh, so yeah, that's a really cool idea. Actually, I might, might try doing that more often. Um, yeah, good shout. The one thing I really want Twitter to add back is the newsletter integration with review because that used to drive so many uh, subscribers to my newsletter account. Because when you'd go onto someone's Twitter profile below the bio, it would have a section that would say, this is my newsletter, click it, subscribe. It was like a one click subscribe option. And it's just so effortless. Whereas now you have to get people off the platform, get them to input their email, then click subscribe to even get on it. And I've, I have seen that since that was removed, my, my newsletters uh, numbers went down on, on a weekly basis. Um, something that I would recommend also, Gwilym, is that if you are going to start tweeting, um, use Hype Fury because it does have um, an option where you can say, if this particular tweet gets more than five retweets or it gets 20 likes, it will automatically reply to that tweet with whatever you want it to be. And the way that I was using that was, um, you know, if you like this tweet, then you might like my newsletter, The Creator Stream, and then it would have a link to it. And that's been a, been a very good way for me to get more people in the newsletter as well. So I definitely recommend that strategy if you want to, to start getting more people off the platform onto your newsletter. Yeah, I think, thank you for all the advice, gents, on newslettering. 